to the bucket courses. A place, a great place to keep learning new things, meeting new people, some of whom are here for the first time. Um, my name is Barb Lease. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to see all of you. Um, here are some things you need to know before we start. Masks are welcome, but not required. Please silence your cell phone. Turn on your T-coil if you have one. If there's an opportunity for questions, Janet and I will come around with the mics. Please speak directly into the mic. Coffee and cookies cost about $2 a person. If you're able, you might consider putting a little funds in the big green bucket. And if you're able, at the end, uh, please help put up the chair. You can put up your chair. There's two dollies at the back, and there's two dollies at the front to put them on. And now for the main event. Roger Vetter is a retired Col Grinnell College professor of music. For nearly three decades, he taught a range of courses, directed ensembles, and served in leadership roles at Grinnell College. His teaching and research have taken him all over the world, including Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Ghana, and Zimbabwe. In addition to his research on the history and impact of sound recording, an interest in musical instruments as objects of material culture led to the creation of an online educational resource project called the Grinnell College Musical Instrument Collection, where visitors can explore musical instruments from around the world. And you have a treat during the break. I'm just going to tell you. Please join me in welcoming Professor Roger Vetter. Okay, can you all hear me? Fine, okay, great. Um, technology often trumps me, not just tradition, as is the t title of my presentation. First of all, I would like to thank all you for coming and for the CEC committee for organizing this wonderful series of um, presentations that we can all take part in whenever we have time to. Um, and um, there was a crew of guys here early this morning setting up chairs. They had their tape measures out and all that to make sure the rows were perfectly spaced. Um, so uh, thanks to um, Bob and uh, Jack and Steve, I won't give their last names, for um, all the prep work to make this program go smoothly. Hopefully technology gods will be with me as well today. Um, I also have uh, one other thing to say before I start into my presentation, and that is that there is a lovely display over at uh, Pearson Hall at the Mayflower put up or assembled and uh, put up by Bill Pollock um, that is a, a great survey of the history of sound recording in the various formats that, that it's taken. And it would be a, uh, uh, I, I am not going to cover a lot of that in this presentation, but it would be a nice supplement if you are already, especially a resident of Mayflower, to swing by there and spend 15, 20 minutes uh, reading his presentation and looking at the, the objects and the charts he has assembled in that case in the foyer, the lobby of Pearson Hall, just off um, um, Broad Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues, I believe is the address. Okay, on to the presentation. Uh, the creation of the music recording industry was an epical moment in the history of human music making because suddenly it was possible for people to experience performance of music in a setting and at a time different from that of the performance itself. This splitting of the context of creation and reception of music was magical at the time, because previously, since humans first started making music, all music making was live and embedded in social context that added meaning to the sounds being produced. It is difficult for us to appreciate the magical quality of recorded music back then, in the late 19th century, 
uh, because we have all been born into a world in which recorded music already exists and is commonplace. But perhaps this postcard from the Edison Record Company um, will uh, captures uh, someone upon their first encounter with recorded music and the novelty and the joy that brought to them in the moment of that particular encounter. Although the invention of uh, sound capture by the American inventor Thomas Edison in 1877 marked the beginning of the recording era, it took another 20 years before several requisite conditions came together in America that made it possible for music recordings to become the basis of an industry that would, in rapid order, impact human musical experience not only in the US and Europe, but much of the rest of the world as well. I can't possibly do justice to the complex process by which this transformation came about, so I have decided to confine myself to a 30-year period beginning in 1895 and to focus on only one of the two major formats of sound recording technology that were in existence at the time discs and uh, as opposed to cylinders. A downside of this is that it diverts our attention from the inventor of sound capture, Thomas Edison, and towards several individuals of whom you pr have probably never heard. Throughout the 50 years following the invention of his cylinder recorder, Edison championed the development of his in original invention and founded a company that for decades produced phonographs and thousands of cylinder recording for commercial sale. But this all came to an abrupt end with the stock market, um, uh, Black, was it Black Tuesday, Black Monday, in 1929. Okay, his company went belly up. But even though he invested his whole life primarily in the cylinder recordings, it was becoming clear by the turn of the 20th century that the other record format was going to prove itself to be much more viable foundation upon which to build a record industry. Uh, it is this rapid maturation of the disc format in the final years of the 19th century and the founding of what became the dominant musical recording company of the first quarter of the 20th century, the Victor Talking Machine Company, that will be the focus of my presentation. It is my hope that upon reflecting over the material I, I will be presenting, you will sense how so many of your are habits of living with and through recorded music were, shared, uh, were shaped during this 30-year period upon which I will be focusing in this presentation. Okay, so what's in the title? In the title of this presentation, by tradition, um, uh, uh, is uh, something that none of us in this room has experienced, life totally without recorded music. It is so central, it has been central to our lives, our musical encounters since birth for all of us in this room. And, and I, when I say this, it doesn't mean that we still don't have live musical encounters in our life or that we don't ourselves participate in the production of music, the performance of music. But um, believe me, even if you don't have a record player or a CD player or access to a streaming service uh, uh, in the such. Um, you hear recorded music on every advertisement, um, on every TV show, every movie you see and all that, uh, all um, uh, in incorporates in its production recorded music. Technology in the title of this presentation is referring specifically to music recording technology, which in turn is not absolutely synonymous with recording technology. Recording technology commenced, as I mentioned earlier, with Edison's 1877 invention of his tin foil phonograph. But for over a decade, he and others saw its greatest business application, not as music, but an office dictation machine. Um, 
for music recording technology to truly challenge thousands of years of live musical only tradition, inventors industrialists had to evolve Edison's invention into equipment and media that could be mass produced, durable, dependable, and affordable enough to be welcomed into the homes of millions of consumers. It was only by the final few years of the 1800s uh, that had enough advances had been made in sound capture technology, in material science, what do you make records out of, um, phonogram uh, duplication, and machine design for a music industry of scale to emerge with the goal of making recorded music entertainment in the home normative, not just possible, but normal the thing that everyone partakes in, or almost everyone. Okay, before I go on further, I just want to uh, point out that there was a misty, mystifying number uh, of terms that were in play in the late part of the, 18th, the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century in regard to the mediums, uh, the kind of equipment that you would use to play back recordings. Um, there were two basic formats, and you probably all know this, they're cylinders, and later on during intermission I'll play you a, a couple of cylinder recordings. And there were, uh, was the disc format, which we're all much more familiar with, not so much from the original format of disc recording, but from uh, later generations of uh, discs, the 45 RPMs and long play uh, LP records and the such. So, in the cylinder phono phonograph, Edison copyrighted the name, the label phonograph for his inve invention. Okay, other companies couldn't, at least for 30 years, use the term phonograph to describe their phonographs. Okay, um, another company em emerged in the early 1880s called Columbia, uh, and they could make a go at the market because they bought a patent um, that uh, changed the structure of the cylinder itself and how the signal was embedded on it. Um, and so they had to create a new name. It's, 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 it's sort of a twisting of the word phonograph, but they call their, um, media, uh, their equipment, their company, their recordings, the, the graphophone, okay? Graphophone, phonograph, you know, it's a, it, but it's good enough for the patent office. Okay, so uh, they continue. Um, as far as the disc format uh, goes, that came along a little later, as we'll find out in more detail in a while, starting in about 1887. Uh, the inventor of that medium uh, was a, a person by the name of Emil Berliner. And he, of course, had to find a new name for his equipment and his system, and he chose to, he invented the word gramophone, which is still used in many languages in countries around the world to mean phonograph, uh, the gramophone. Uh, and you can see vestiges of er Edison's original name in that as well. Um, the successor to Berliner, uh, the, the Victor Company, which we'll be focusing on here, um, found it expedient at the time of its creation to talk about talking machines. So their phonographs were called talking machines. And finally, when through some subterfuge, uh, the Columbia Company was able to buy patents for a gramophone-like machine uh, uh, right around 1900, uh, they decided to call their phonographs, disc phonographs, disc graphophones. They, they already had the term graphophone for their cylinders and all. So if you were living in the 1890s in the United States, you'd be hearing phonograph, graphophone, gramophone, talking, you know, these, these were all in currency then, and they all have been subsumed under, for us in uh, our times, under the word phonograph. Okay, so the original uh, word that is, uh, the, the naming of the technology by Edison is used today. So this presentation will focus on the disc format because it far outlasted the cylinder format and was the forerunner, forerunner of the microgroove 
formats, 45s and LPs, that we are familiar with from living through the 1950s and the 1980s. In fact, even LPs, and I, th I think 45s to a certain extent, are being sort of revived as we speak. They're coming, they're coming back to a small extent. Okay, so here's my plan of action for the presentation. Um, act one, uh, this is before intermission. Uh, I will present a real quick and dirty overview of how America's first big disc recording company, the Victor Talking Machine Company, and its affiliate in England, the Gramophone Company, came about. During intermission, I have a little concert arranged for you where I have four different machines here, and we're going to hear each one of those in succession. You can go out and get your coffee and cookies, and some of you might want to move closer because some of the machines are louder than other machines. But um, the content of what is going to be performed and you'll understand why I use that word in, in, in a few minutes, uh, but on these machines um, has nothing to do with the presentation today at all. It's just a, a freebie concert for you to enjoy the, the novelty of this old equipment that actually 120 years after its manufacture still works. Try that with your CD player. Uh, okay. Following intermission, I'm going to explore how the Victor Company persuaded, and this is an important word, persuaded a skeptical American public to accept into their homes and their lives record players and recorded music. It wasn't something that was just people were really excited about, and I'll explain why that is. And then finally, as a person who has had the great good fortune to be able to travel around the world, um, uh, I, I'm particularly interested in the fact that the same companies, the Victor Company, the Columbia Company, the people that manufactured all these things, um, almost immediately after the right stuff fell in place to create the recording industry in the United States, they went global with it. Okay, they started establishing uh, uh, re recording plants, they had agents, uh, you know, uh, talent agents to find people to record. They sent people on expeditions to India, China, Japan, Southeast Asia, uh, South America to make thousands of recordings that could then be duplicated and sent back to those various locales as the seed of a new practice of listening to recorded music uh, around the world. Okay, here we go. Act one, from whence came the Victor and Gramophone companies. Okay, I have, since I, I'm drawing upon sort of the structure of opera here, or, or plays um, with acts, um, I, I'm going to just present you with, to start out with a, 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 cast, a, a list of the cast of characters that we'll be talking about over the next few minutes before break. Uh, and these are the names that I'm pretty sure most of you have not heard before. Certainly, you, I think everyone in this room has probably heard of Edison, if not for the phonograph or something else. But uh, in, in the terms of the development of the disc as the primary format going on into the future, uh, the names of Emil Berliner, a German immigrant to the United States. Um, he is the inventor of the disc format and of the gramophone machine to play his discs. And he learned to become an entrepreneur uh, on the spot. I mean, he wasn't trained at an MBA program or anything like that. Um, like everyone else in the music business at this time, they started out being inventors or something else, and they got into the music business and they became entrepreneurs, if not s serious businessmen. Frank Seaman, uh, he was a professional marketing specialist in the um, 1890s, and Berliner hired him to promote and sell his equipment and recordings in the United States. A guy named Fred Gaysberg, who was only about 20 years ago when Berliner hired him to be his talent scout. He also played the piano, so he oftentimes accompanied singers on early Berliner discs. Um, and a re turned out to be an excellent recording engineer over time. 
He will come back on several occasions throughout this presentation. Eldridge Johnson, perhaps the biggest name in this group. He even overshadows Emil Berliner, whose inventions he took over. Um, uh, he started working his way into this invention in the 1890s, where um, uh, he turned the Berliner hand-cranked machine. The motor was your hand crank this machine into a spring motor powered machine. And all these machines you see up here have spring motors in them. But he came up with a cheap, practical spring motor to, um, to um, uh, uh, run the, the platter, the, the turntable um, it, that you set the record on. And uh, then he, he was a tinker. He wasn't an inventor so much as he would take a, an invention of someone else and come up and, and transform it into something that's really practical and uh, easily reproducible, inexpensive, and the such. He was really, really good at that. Anyway, he, end, he ends up being the person who um, uh, incorporates the Victor Talking Machine Company a few years later. Um, William Owen is a guy who worked for the Berliner Record Company in the 1890s, <coughs> and Berliner sent him to Europe to be his representative and to introduce and sell Berliner gramophones uh, in England and on the continent continent and on continental Europe. Uh, Mr. Rappaport uh, was a Russian businessman, uh, and he introduced. Uh, he's in this in this cast of characters because he introduced one very important idea the, the, or concept, the, uh, the concept of a, a, an elite um, a series of recordings that would attract a different clientele <coughs> from most of the other recordings that were being made at the time. And uh, uh, he, he's the one, as we'll find out, that suggested that recording companies start using bright red labels for their deluxe series and putting outrageous prices on them. They'll sell better. <laughs> I'm remembering of Grinnell College deciding to go from a Best Buy college to a competitor with uh, other schools out east like itself. And, and the, the first thing they did is they raised tuition from you know, 30,000 a year to 60,000 a year. Okay, so it's uh, this, this idea of, okay, don't undersell yourself. Okay, this is great stuff. So anyway, he introduced this important idea, which uh, 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 was an, uh, turned out to be an important stepping stone uh, in the recording industri industry, uh, uh, convincing people of the merits of recorded music, of the value of it, the cultural value um, of, of recorded music, even if. A lot of people didn't buy the records because they just certainly couldn't um, afford it. But nonetheless, it sent a message to the general public that this is not just vaudeville minstrelsy and things like that, but this is high art that can be reproduced on this, and you can have it in your home, and you can be improved by it. So a, a small character in this cast, but he came up with a big idea. <coughs> Finally, Leon Douglas is a ma marketing and advertising specialist for Victor, and uh, he um, was very important in um, uh, uh, devi devising an advertising campaign for Victor, of which we'll see a lot of his work later on in the presentation, um, because advertising is persuasion, and the general public needed persuasion about inviting recorded music into their home this time. Okay. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you a real quick run through about a 20 year period, or uh, what is it, uh, 87, uh, 15 year period uh, of, of the d development of, uh, that takes us from the disc as an invention to the disc as the foundation for a huge uh, pre recorded music industry. Okay. Uh, the first several years were sort of slow in their developments, but the important ones took place. Um, Emil Berliner um, uh, had acquired some capital to explore the 
the slow evolving world of sound recording. He came up with a, a design for a telephone um, receiver, uh, uh, microphone basically, that Alexander Graham Bell bought the patent for that thing from him. And that was his seed money for his explorations into the world of sound recording. So uh, he um, also was an important contributor to the evolution of that technology, telephone technology in uh, America and Europe. Okay, so uh, he came up with the idea for an alter alternative uh, form for the phonogram, the, the um, object that contains the signal uh, for reproducing music, which had to that time been a cylinder um, but he came up with the idea of, uh, of a disc that had a spiral groove from the outside edge to the center in it. And then on the sides of that groove, uh, an, an image of the sound waves of a performance would be uh, uh, carved out of the sides of that thing. So when you ran a needle over it later on, the needle would wiggle in such a way to set a little diaphragm in motion and put it through a horn and you could hear it, uh, uh, at least a semblance of the original um, performance. His technology was called a lateral cut method and this was important because um, uh, all Edison equipment was heavily patented for its vertical cut technology. It's where the, the signal is in if you can imagine this being a groove, the signal is in hills and dales that are left from the recording process in the bottom of the groove. Okay, so you couldn't do that. If you want to start up a music industry, you couldn't do that without um, uh, an agreement with, uh, with Edison. Okay, so uh, it, uh, one little thing, but it's an important one in, in terms of the evolution of the disc. Um, he also came up with um, some early stages of a method for making multiple copies of a single master recording by producing a negative metal stamp from a wax coated metal plate original. So the original was still recorded in wax on a metal plate, but then through electro, um, electro, uh, all these scientific processes, you would make a reverse of all the information that's gathered in those grooves and make it out of metal so that you could use that as a stamper for making hundreds if not thousands of copies of a, of a single performance. The cylinder did not have a method sort of like this until 1900, but he was already working on it in the 1880s, in the early 1890s. Um, he designed his own hand-powered phonograph, or I should say graphophone, a gramophone, uh, to play his discs, and he starts marketing his, his gramophone and recordings as a novelty, mostly in Europe. He was from Germany, after all. Now, from 1895 to 1902, things get a little more complex. The story, the plot thickens, so to say, and so I'm going to be dealing with each year, at one year, at, I'm going to be dealing with this period one year at a time. In 1895, Berliner establishes the National Gramophone Company to sell his machines and indestructible discs in the U.S. And I, I, I want us to, to look at this because this I don't have an, a Berliner machine. Val, I don't have everything. Uh, and I promise you I won't get one. But uh, uh, this is what the Berliner's original machine looked like. Here you can see the hand crank and there's a belt that goes over some, some gears and turns vertical motion into lateral motion and, and spins the disc around. It has a, s oops, stop that. <laughs> I have to be careful. Um, I have to be not press to it. Um, uh, it has a sound box. This is where the diaphragm is located, that when the needle runs in the grooves, it wiggles, and that is transduced into sound again with a mica or some other substance, a little thing in there. And that's attached to a tone arm that then, and this was common, you notice there's no horn. You think of horns, you know, with early phonographs, but it's to uh, rubber tubes. And usually a couple people could listen in on what's going on, and they seem to be enjoying themselves 
uh, enough, but the fidelity certainly couldn't have been the two things, especially if the guy cranking gets a little tired uh, or gets too excited and, and goes fast. But this is it. This is, this is what was first marketed. Um, sti it's still not ready for the big time yet. There's, there's, uh, but a, a lot of the things are starting to fall in place. Um, in 1896, um, a machinist by the name of Eldridge Johnson designs a spring motor and redesigns other gramophone components for Berliner. Uh, and, and in this year also, um, Berliner hires Frank Seaman, a professional seasoned marketer of anything that you want him to sell, uh, but he hires him to sell the gramophone in the U.S. And here we see a, a 1897 ad and the machine we see here, you notice, doesn't have someone turning a hand crank, but it has a spring motor in the back. That's the spring motor that Johnson designed for the Berliner machine. And then it also has a horn, so a larger group of people can listen in rapt attention to what's being played on, on this machine. And it's interesting, the, uh, you'll see that later on as we get into later ads, the, there's a lot less wording to them, okay? This is a very wordy ad. You had to be sort of a, 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 a nerd uh, uh, of the time to be interested to read all this stuff. But basically what it's doing is it's trying to persuade people with this equipment, if you buy this equipment and the discs, you can put together programs for home entertainment um, that consists of Berliner records um, and um, you can even, you know, charge admission if you want. You can make a little money off of it. But uh, already embedded in all this small print are, are, are a lot of the um, messages that the Victor Company later on, um, just five years later, would pound into the public for years and years about this being home entertainment and the greatest performers are brought into the pr your presence in your house and, and things such as that. Okay, um, uh, 1897, Eldridge Johnson introduces further improvements and starts manufacturing the, imp the improved gramophone. I, I don't know, this was a marketing, I, I guess, ploy for a little bit to put the equal signs in there. Um, and then Fred Gaysberg, this young pianist, comes on board to the Berliner uh, company uh, and, and starts seeking out talent and helping to make recordings. Uh, Berliner starts to make discs from a shellac compound. So Berliner, this is a later development. Uh, uh, the um, cylinders of the day were made out of various wax compounds and they wore out very quickly. Plus there is no way to easily make multiple copies of it. So it's rather humorous to read about how the Columbia Company or the Edison Company made multiple copies of the recordings. An artist would have to come into the studio if it was a singer, maybe there would be four machines in front of him or her each one with a cylinder in it, and they would have to sing a performance. And then someone would put in four new things, and they'd have to sing the performance again. And they'd have to do this over and over and over again to get you know, whatever the demand was perceived to be for that particular artist or that particular song at, at the time. Um, if a, a marching band or a military band came in, and these were very popular types of groups to record because uh, they uh, because of the brass instruments and all that. They recorded well. Okay. Uh, uh, they, they matched the technology, the, the insensitivity of this technology of the time. And they could maybe have a bank of 10 machines set up. And so they would only have to repeat their full performance 10 times in order to get the 100 discs for sale and all that. Pretty tedious and all that. Um, Okay, so, but Berliner came up with this new, he'd already come up with the idea of a stamping machine for his discs, and the, the, just the shape of a disc made that possible. But he was coming up with compounds uh, uh, that um, would be durable, but also would not be noisy when you ran a needle over them. They'd only reproduce the sound that was 
captured in the grooves, not the sounds of the grooves themselves, I guess you could, you, you could say. And shellac became the standard for the recording industry through um, the, uh, the 1930s. And at, at the beginning of World War II, shellac had other applications for the war machines, so record companies had to look for something else to make the records out, and that's where the word vinyl comes in. We've often collected vinyl. That became the substitute for shellac compounds used for records. Okay, now just to give you an idea of what this music might have sounded like, I have in my collection a total of one Berliner gramophone production. And it tells me, okay, okay you notice, first of all, it's on a pretty small disc. It's a seven inch disc. Um, e Berliner's gramophone. And everything has, in these early years, has three or four patent numbers on it. You know, they were really into um, litigation and protecting copyrights. Um, and then, so we're gonna, we're gonna hear, and I have up here the contents of this particular recording, Near My God to Thee, by Messieurs Dudley and Harding. And actually, after the original rat wax master was made of this, they had Mr. Dudley and Harding sign on the soft wax before it was turned into press. So you have their signatures there. And it even tells you that it was recorded on two June 27th, 1898 in New York City. Okay, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> uh, it's, it's pretty scratchy, but if you listen really carefully, you can probably recognize the tune. piano accompaniment. Okay, and in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there, but uh, you have an impression. Now, I don't know how many owners there have been of this particular recording. I just came across it maybe 10, 15 years ago, and I've played it a total of maybe six times or eight times. Um, I don't know how many times it's been played before that. It probably sounded better when it was, an original, uh, when it was originally bought by its first owner, but maybe not too much better. Okay. <laughs> Okay, 1898. I'm going to pick up the pace here because I know we're all hungry. Uh, William o Owen, who was uh, 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 in the Berliner camp uh, and was sent to Europe uh, the year before by Berliner, uh, establishes the Gramophone Company in London and starts selling Johnson, Eldridge Johnson produced Berliner gramophones throughout Europe. And Berliner sends Fred Gaysberg and a nephew of Berliner to Europe in this year uh, to help out Owen start up his recording program, get his catalog built up, um, and Gaysberg oversaw that. And the nephew of Berliner um, went off to Germany to uh, co uh, coordinate his efforts with some of Berliner, I think it was Berliner's brother, to create a, a pressing facility where the multiple copies from the stamping original would be made of, of a recording. So it's only sort of an international uh, organization being built up here. Uh, in 1899, big year, things get really complicated. The Graphophone Company, Columbia, sues the National Gramophone Company and Frank Seaman, their uh, salesperson, for patent infringement, and a New York judge places a restraining order that forbids Seaman from selling Berliner gramophones and discs. So the inventor of this medium is blocked from making and selling his, uh, his own uh, products uh, because of a supposed uh, uh, patent infringement. So Seaman 
decides to desert Berliner. It, it, this is all very complicated, but he had other issues with Berliner and the, and the Berliner gramophone company. And he establishes his own company to produce a slightly redesigned Berliner gramophone. It was slightly redesigned, but designed, it had enough little differences to convince the patent office that he could have his own patent for his um, machine. Uh, and he produces this machine and recordings under the, the, the label of Zonophone. Um, and he does all this just to get around the restraining order on uh, Berliner gramophones, or take advantage of it, I guess you could say. And then in a very interesting move, Seaman then signs an agreement with the graphophone company, which up to this time had only been produ producing cylinder machines, so that they could start producing disc players, zonophone machines, and all that. So there's a lot of music, you know, dancing going on here. In Europe, Owen, the founder of the gramophone affiliate in, in London, expands to the continent, continent and, and opens offices in Germany, Russia, and Austria. The Germany com company would, uh, affiliate would eventually evolve, evolve into the Deutsche Grammophon Gesellschaft, uh, which is still with us today. Uh, these things are all have these deep roots. Um, Gaysberg, the young accompanist recording engineer, is sent on a, a recording expedition all around Europe where he's recording all kinds of music from gypsy bands to uh, local folk musics and the such to be pressed into records and, s and to start up new markets um, all around Europe. Also in 1899, Owen, the, the head of the gramophone company, buys for his London office uh, the painting, His Master Voice, by Francis Barad. Uh, the painting features Nipper the dog, an improved um, a Berliner gramophone. Uh, and this would later become um, a, the most recognized trademark ever in the United States and possibly the world. God, I, 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 I won't go into the story of this, but it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, okay, 1900, we're almost getting to break here. Elders Johnson sets up the Consolidated Talking Machine Company to get around the legal hurdles uh, put up by um, uh, the former uh, employee, Frank Seaman, of the Berliner Company. Um, and he starts, uh, and he continues manufacturing Berliner model machines and selling a lot of them to the gramophone company in England so that uh, he can have some money coming in. He hires Leon Douglas to sell the gramophones he is producing. Uh, uh, he has already produced and are stockpiled in his factory for Berliner. Uh, and uh, then Douglas uh, convinces Johnson to invest heavily in advertising and sales all of a sudden take off of uh, his machines. Berliner visits Owen in England and sees the painting on the wall and decides that and seeks a US copyright for that for that painting, that image, uh, and which would later be made into the trademark for Johnson's Victor uh, Consolidated, well, for the initially for the Consolidated Talking Machine Company, but eventually for Victor. Um, Johnson starts, this, this sounds so little and mundane, but Johnson started, um, he invented the idea of having a paper label in the middle of the disc. It's something we don't even think about, but before that, things were, it was just black and information was engraved in the record. And so you could you have different colored labels to distinguish different series within the output of a record company um, and the such. Uh, so he starts producing these paper labels. That's when that was introduced. Uh, and he also starts using the, n the nipper dog trademark symbol on all of his productions. Um, this Russian gramophone merchant, Rappaport, uh, suggests to a gramophone company agent in St. Petersburg that they should start producing an elite artist series with red paper labels and high sales price to make them ap appear classy, okay? And it wasn't only to make them appear classy to the, um, uh, the buyers of records, but to 
the Russian opera stars that had up to this point poo-pooed um, uh, sound recording technology. And this, would, he felt, would make them willing to record on this label. Okay, and I think I have just one more slide to get us up to break. Um, 1901, uh, yeah, Johnson establishes the Victor Talking Machine <coughs> Company. Berliner is a 40% stakeholder in this so that Johnson has access to all of his patents going forward. Uh, in Europe, uh, back in Europe, the Gramophone Company, which by the way is 50% owned by Victor, um, <coughs> takes Rappaport's advice and launches its Red Seal series in Russia, featuring top Russian opera stars and costing $5 a disc for a little 10-inch disc like this, one-sided, there's nothing on the backside, uh, would charge $5. Can you imagine what $5 was back at that time? It's probably 50 bucks, you couldn't 50 bucks today. In 1902, um, Gaysberg records for the gramophone company 10 records of an up-and-coming Italian opera tenor by the name of Enrico Caruso singing Ital Italian opera arias. Uh, and then in that same year, Gramophone Company launches its own red label series, Rappaport, uh, in London featuring the Gaysbergs recordings of Caruso and other big uh, stars of European opera. Okay, that's break now. Sorry, a little OT. I will start the concert and maybe cut it a little short. But as I said, you're welcome to go out, use the bathroom, get coffee and cookies, and come in and out of this. But... Um, uh, I have this small little concert um, prepared for you. And we'll read the 1890s. It was a novelty. It was really fascinating. And all that. But the quality of the recordings, the, the, uh, in, uh, the delicateness, delicateness of the media on which it was recorded, um, the fact that the equipment was really, ex it, it was just a lot of things about especially cylinder playing that was not conducive to the establishment of a recording industry. And so I've just tried to encapsulate some of my perceptions of what attitudes in the 1890s were toward sound recording technology. Uh, and uh, amongst the general <laughs> public, um, very, it was very still considered very much a novelty. And you usually find it in nickel arcades and saloons and restaurants. Um, and uh, these, the equipment that was being played on was far too expensive to have uh, in the house. So uh, this is the only place where you would encounter this. And often you would have those ear, um, those ear tubes to listen to it on, uh, except in a restaurant. They, the restaurant would buy it so they didn't have to hire a band or an orchestra to play in, their, uh, in an upper-class restaurant. Um, highbrow, highbrow socialites was, um, and uh, the performers of the music that they patronized, the opera singers at the Met and uh, other great opera houses in America and Europe, um, they, as I mentioned earlier, just were not at all interested in this technology. It didn't sound good. And plus, there are all these lowbrow performers that were being recorded, you know, minstrelsy shows, um, th um, vaudeville acts, and all that, that they didn't want to be associated with this at all. It didn't interest them until that guy in St. Petersburg, Russia came up with the idea, well, if you want to get the best of the greatest opera singers, which had a lot of political cachet at the time, uh, you have to uh, make your productions pretty classy to convince um, people of the potential of this new technology. And the companies themselves were well aware of the shortcomings of what they were working with at the time in terms of how they had to have performers make sometimes dozens of uh, repeats of a, of a particular performance just to make a few dozen recordings, you know, that could be sold and all that. Um, that, that once they sold these uh, cylinders, they were good for maybe 20 replays before the, the um, before the sound quality was scraped away by the needle running over it and over it again. Because uh, the wax, uh, even though it's some they sometimes fortified it with metal shavings and other things, it was never really indestructible. Uh, thank goodness.
Yeah. It's not my heart, so don't worry. Uh, okay. So they were, uh, and, and this is exactly why in the 1890s, um, record industry, record companies, big record companies had not yet formed. They were close, but they had not yet performed. Uh, formed. So act two, how Victor went about investing music recordings with, uh, with cultural capital. Okay, the big challenge that Victor and all other companies in American Europe faced in the year 1902 was how to convince the consumer public that the industry's products, their phonographs and their records, were no longer poor sounding and frail novelties, but serious and uh, robust instruments, you, you'll see why I have that in parentheses, and performers that for a reasonable price could bring entertainment, be it of a popular or an exalted character, uh, and cultural edification into the homes of most Americans or Europeans, okay? That, by the way, could not afford to go and, and would not be welcome at the um, uh, Metropolitan Opera House uh, of the time. So how did Victor go about meeting this challenge? Well, advertising, and a lot of it, and we'll see a lot of it, and it's, it's pretty fascinating to, to look at, uh, the, the strategies they take. Um, uh, a advertising is persuasion, and you'll see persuasion at work, trying to proceed a lukewarm um, consumer population. House, you need this. <laughs> you know, that's what life is. It's just, it, 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 <laughs> okay. uh, the credit we're always looking for shortcuts to production and new technological tweaks to improve the sound quality of their equipment and, and their recordings. And it was probably uh, uh, the, 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 an, an exemplar of this particular um, uh, activity. Uh, the, and we'll see this traced in some of their um, advertisements as well. Uh, like the gramophone company in London, they established not a red label, but a red seal series. Uh, and uh, for many, many years, the only people that they recorded on this, this particular series were the opera singers at the New York Metropolitan Opera. Caruso had come over to the United States in 1903, and he played out the rest of his career at the Metropolitan Opera House. And so he was recorded time and again. During his lifetime, Victor released 180 some recordings um, by, by him alone, as well as a whole host of other um, opera stars. Um, they sort of came up with this idea of creating superstars or, you know, uh, uh, exclusive artists and all that. And they would always advertise, oh, Caruso records only for us. And in return, Caruso would say, oh yeah, this is the only equipment and the only recording company that produces sound that matches the, you know, my live voice and all that. So buy the Victor brand. You know, so this, you know, this give and go between the company and the artists. Um, they promoted the home. Home was in every advertisement. Mention of the home is a space in which to experience great music of whatever kind, whatever kind of music you wanted. And um, they are always suggesting to the consumers that Victor products and the experience they afford are lifelike. There's a fidelity to them. You can't tell the difference between performance by and recorded performance as captured by us and produced on our records. So um, I think you can tell from the recordings I played for you uh, you know, it, different machines produce, you know, pretty good representations of performances, but you can always tell the recordings, and it's, you know, it, it, it's not live. But part of Victor's promotional work was to convince the public that, hey, this is it. You know, why go to the opera? You know, you can hear it right in your, your living room. It's, it's the same thing. And we'll see this time and again pushed in its advertisements. So I have a series of about 12 ads um, 
to, to look at. And in the bottom right-hand corner of each slide, I tell you what year this ad came out in, in what magazine. Most of these appeared in magazines of the period. So this is an ad from the year in which the, the Victor Rec uh, Talking Machine Company came into being. Okay, so this is a very early ad. Um, pushing topics such as recording artists. Oh, shoot. This is buttons, yeah. Um, Sousa plays only for the victor. Jules Levy, the wonderful coronetist, plays only for the victor. The greatest opera and vaudeville stars sing only for the victor talking machine. You know, so it's this kind of hyperbole uh, ad advertising talk, which um, was really mastered by the people in, uh, in Leon Dutz's office that came up with these advertising. Uh, you also see home mentioned once or twice in this fidelity. Um, no other machine will reproduce their masterpieces faithfully, naturally, perfectly. You know, it's this kind of language that uh, they really push to convince, persuade people that oh, I got to get this. Uh, here's an ad from a few years later, appeared in the Ladies' Home Journal. By the way, recording companies in general saw housewives as targets of a lot of their advertising because, you know, they, you know, the man wore the, the pants outside of the family. Inside the household, women oftentimes swayed largely. And she was also in charge of the kids, and so the, the edification of fine music in your house for the development of your children was often pushed and things such as this. But this particular ad... Um, oh, first of all, I love it sings everything, it plays everything. Okay, it's, it's not a machine, it's, 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 it's a human, you know, it's, it's a performer. But they're pushing uh, these new improvements that have been made. If you notice uh, on this particular machine, uh, it, there's a brace in the back of it that holds the weight of the horn up. And in and, and the previous design, all the weight of the horn would come down on the needle in the record uh, when it was playing, which would lead to degradation, of course, of the record. But they figured out a way to get that up. They also have this continuous path from the sound box to its amplification uh, in the horn. So they're pushing that, but they're also starting to push stars. There are stars and mention of the greatest performers of the time in your own home. Um, this kind of thing. And the phonograph is an instrument. It's not a machine, it's an instrument. Okay, uh, from a few years later, uh, they obviously had brought in new kinds of uh, uh, artists into their, um, their advertising office. Here we have this wonderful, you know, sort of arts and crafts period. Um, drawing of a, a, an intimate moment between a husband and wife in front of the fireplace in their home, and the only other person in the room is the, oops, <laughs> is the Victor machine, which is providing them with the greatest music of the time by the greatest artists, and um, I, I love things like this. It is the perfect living voice. You know, um, Again, you have to put this in, um, you have to remember they were still trying to convince the public that th th this was good stuff and they had to have it. And it was getting better all the time, um, admittedly. Um, okay, okay uh, this is the ad that I've come across that has the least text to it. Why? Well, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of association going on here a corner of the music room in the White House. Okay, how do you, how do you put upon the value, the, the classiness of your stuff? Uh, you know, well, you say, well, our machine's in the, in the White House, you know, you know. That's the ultimate home, I guess, for uh, uh, Americans. Okay, I, I love this. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, there's a sales pitch. Will there be a Victrola? Victrola, by the way, is the name of machines that Victor produced with internal horns instead of external horns. So this is an external horn. 
the one in the oak case there is an internal horn. There's no, um, or the last two machines there have internal horns. These have external. Um, it was known that a lot of women found these big horns in their living rooms a little mm, overwhelming and all that, and maybe not in line with their other decor and all that. So Victor's solution was to turn it inwards and, uh, and mask it. Okay, so anyway, here's a house. I don't think it's your typical American house. I, th uh, I, I think it's uh, an industrialist, but uh, here you see the family sitting in their chairs with a Victrola machine. And these people aren't here, only their voices are, because this is Enrico Caruso in a fam famous role they play, and these are other opera stars, current opera stars, in the year 1916. Um, and these people are playing their records, and the fidelity is so great, it's like having them in, you know, these stars in the room performing for you, okay? It's, yeah. So the fidelity is really important, and it's mentioned that the phonograph is the instrument. It's mentioned greatest artists, uh, you know, all this stuff is just, you know, the way advertising works. It's repeated over and over again in slightly different order and guises, but it does have an impact on persuading people. Uh, this is just a, a particular ad from 1909 in Country Life in America journal. I've never heard of it. Uh, but here we go. Uh, recording artists, the greatest artists, the world's greatest singers make records only for the victor. Uh, they don't say it here, but they, these artists that are pictured up here, their recordings would only appear on the Red Seal label Victor Productions because this was the elite. This is the way that, that American insufficiency in comparison to high culture of Europe could be addressed. You can bring these stars from all over Europe, um, French tenor, Italian baritone, Spanish, French, uh, German uh, artists. You can have them all in your own, and you can become as erudite a person in the world as any European is because you are, um, um, you are swept away by the greatness of these performers and their reproduction on Victor machines. Okay, a 1918 ad in the Saturday Evening Post. This is a centerfold. I, I know that has other meanings, but this is a centerfold ad in an in a issue, a release of the Victor Talking Machine Company. It must have cost a pretty penny to put, put this advertisement together, but a lot of things come together here. Home is sort of right in the middle. Every home can have the world's best music on the Victrola. Uh, and the best music, well, it's the Red Seal artists that record, ex oh, stop that. I have, you know, I have to lose weight in my thumb. <laughs> um, Red Seal um, uh, artists are pictured around here, and then Victrola models uh, are here. From the very reasonable $22.50 for this Victor IV, um, up to, what is it, $275 for this model of um, cabinet uh, Vict Victrola. So there's an affordable machine for almost every American family if you're willing to sacrifice a few days or a few weeks salary to buy, buy into this. You can bring into your home and to your family the world's greatest music and artists. Um, the phonograph, uh, they never talk about the phonograph as a machine. It's always an instrument or a voice or a performer, um, things like this. And then artist endorsement is, is embedded in here. Um, only the Victrola satisfies their high artistic demands. They're talking about the world's greatest per opera performers and concert stage performers. Uh, uh, and they make music exclusively for Victor Records. Okay, uh, their cash cow, well, let me see. I don't know if they made that much money off the recordings for it because record companies, even in the beginning, didn't make a lot of money classical art music, concert music um, records. But they always thought it was necessary because this gives them uh, the appearance of 
um, cultural value, um, cultural depth and all that, to, to be able to have in their catalogs and feature in their catalogs these performers that are acknowledged in certain social circles as being the greatest performers. So they, they, they do a lot to um, a advertise their Red Seal um, artists, the, their greatest artists. Whenever you see the word greatest, it generally means opera singers uh, in, in these ads. And uh, this recording, I have, a it says Monarch Record. Uh, Monarch was the, the, the top model of um, uh, Victor record players in 1904. And so for a while they used Monarch as a substitute for Victor on, on, on their labels. But you can see under the picture that's superimposed here of Caruso that you can see that there is still the trademark of Nipper the dog um, underneath it. I just so happen to own a copy of this recording. Okay, and this, and this recording was made in 1904. I can tell you it was made on February 1st, 1904 in a basement room. I don't know what the number of the room was, but it was the basement room of Carnegie Hall where Victor had set up a, a remote uh, recording studio to record the uh, Metropolitan Opera and other performers performing in Carnegie Hall um, and turn their voices and instruments into uh, records. So here we'll listen just to a snap of this recording. Um, Caruso, by the way, was the recording technician's dream performer. His voice was robust. Um, it was in a range that was was sort of the sweet spot of the range that the phonograph was capable of picking up. It couldn't pick up piano very well. Certainly the orchestra had too high and too low a sounds to be picked up effectively at this particular point and all. But Caruso was right there in the middle. And so you have him singing opera arias. There's a piano tinkling in the back. But you have him pounding out these operas. And, and the, um, I can just see uh, Fred Gaysberg or someone in the back going, Yes, this is good. This is great. You know, it's just perfect. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm going to edit this a little bit in the interest of time. Um, recording engineers often talked about, oh, Crusher, he was, he was like a, uh, a natural. He was putting out a lot of volume in certain passages there, uh, which would tend to overload the, the needle uh, making the master record. He knew how to step back or in soft moments move up, and so his voice would be picked up without distortion on the technology of the day and all. He was just a natural at it. That's why, uh, in part, why the, the Victor Company uh, really enjoyed having him as their, um, uh, their um, what do you say, it? main artist that they would push. Okay, back to some more. Okay, so, uh, both are Cruz. I love this. <laughs> okay, the record, there's no difference. You know, Enrico Caruso and Aida and a recording of him singing an aria from Aida, it's, it's the same thing. You know, you don't, you don't need to go to the Met. It, 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 
Okay, I'm going to fly through these. Uh, here's using some of the same images in a later ad, and I'll and I'm not great at math, but I get it. You know, <laughs> the Victor machine, the Victrola, the record of Caruso. Add those together, and what do you get? The real thing. Uh, yeah, you know. Okay, uh, and there's a bit of artist endorsement. Um, and then look at this, Victrolis, $25 to 15 oh, stop that. $25 to $1,500. Okay, so they were going, they were going for, you know, the blue collar house. They were going for, you know, the, the elite of uh, New York society. And, and you, could, you could customize the equipment you buy from them to match your social standing. And, and display display that through your equipment and all that. They don't say it in those words. Okay, and here's a good example of artist endorsement. Uh, this ad came out the year after Caruso died, but he had said n a number of times in interviews during his life that my Victor records shall be my bi biography. You know, and so it just. Okay, a really interesting thing about. Um, about this Red Seal label that records basically opera stars and, and, and for the most part um, operatic arias and all that, that they eventually, if you look at a catalog from 1914, let's say when this ad was made, um, and you look up the name Enrico, Enrico Caruso or Alma Gluck, which uh, this ad is promoting, this a recording by her, um, there's a lot of opera arias, but there's also um, popular repertoires such as a Carry Me Back to Old Virginia, which these opera stars would sing with their operatic voice and with nice, clean orchestral type of accompaniments and all that, but it was still worthy of the elite label because of the star performing, not because of the repertoire. Normally, there were probably other recordings on uh, Victor's Black Seal records, which were just their popular music series and all that, of Take Me Back to Old Virginia by, you know, vaudeville uh, performers and the such. They would never appear on, on a Red Seal recording. And I just so happened to have a copy of this recording, and it, it's way too long, but you'll see that she is not singing operatic music but she's singing in an operatic voice, and that's good enough for Victor to include their, on their Red Seal label. Uh, hopefully I have enough juice in this. Excuse me, I have to get my exercise. Okay, and there's a lot of repetition, so I won't play the whole thing for you, but you, I think you get the idea about the operatic voice and all, and its worthiness for the Red Seal label. I'm pushing forward here, so we're done, hopefully at least in the nick of time. We'll see. Um, okay, so I, I've been talking a lot about the Red Seal uh, records, but of course, uh, Victor Company made by far, uh, uh, the most money off of popular music, dance music, band, you know, marching band music, and, and things such as this. And they also occasionally advertise for this. And this is another striking uh, Saturday evening post centerfold. Uh, and, you know, which must, again, cost a fortune to produce. 
uh, but talks about dancing music, uh, uh, and it mentions home here somewhere that you can. Uh, anyway, it uh, it does. It mentions. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. Here we go. It's right in front of me. Um, home, uh, popular music for social dancing. Instead of have hiring a band, you can just have your Victrola there playing all the most recent recordings by dance bands. That and there will be hundreds and hundreds of them uh, in the catalogs for Victor Recording Company. Um, I think I read somewhere that uh, even though Victor pushed their Red Seal labels, that they may maybe. 15% of their profits off of that series of records as opposed to the other records of a more popular nature. And that is a theme that goes right up to the present day in record companies who feel it's still important to produce classical records even though the, the payback is, is minimal or they might even come out in the red producing those. But as long as they have enough popular music stars on their label, bringing in millions and billions of dollars, they can afford to keep up these, these old habits. Um, and as I said, another very um, popular kind of music in the popular music series were military style bands. Uh, and uh, this particular drawing is of Lieutenant John Philip Sousa in the US Naval Reserve Band. Um, so, and they, they list here the many different bands that were recorded time and again, not just American bands, but European bands uh, and the such. And there was a lot of this music, Ag again, it recorded very well. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the, and so it was sort of favored by the company. Okay, moving right along, because I'm running out of time as usual. Um, one thing I find fascinating about all this is that it, it's sort of like, the record industry was a liquid before 1901 or 1902, and then like the gelatin settled in, and all of a sudden it was a, it, it took form and shape, and we had a record industry. They were not happy to just sit there and make money off of the American, American and the European markets. They wanted to go global. So in 1902, the gramophone company in London sends Fred Gaysburg, this is the person who a year before had made the first 10 recordings of Caruso's voice. Uh, they sent him to Asia, to India first, and then Burma, Thailand, Java, China, Japan, to make recording after recording of local musicians. In a six months period, he made 1,700 recordings uh, while in the Far East. Um, and uh, closer to home, the Victor Company sends recording expeditions to Mexico, Hawaii, and Japan in 1905. Um, in 1907, the Gramophone Company and Victor, who are affiliates of one another, agree to divide the world between them in a coordinated strategy to establish new markets worldwide. When I say new markets, it means markets, but it means introducing the idea of listening to this thing and these reproductions of live performances. Uh, it, it's something that people aren't, it's, it's unnatural for a lot of people to do that. And so they want to make it natural for a larger group of people worldwide. And they would um, constitute the foundation for uh, the, the record recording industry. In fact, sales weren't ever as big as they were in America and Europe, but in some areas, such as India uh, and Japan, sales were strong enough for uh, Victor and gramophone companies to establish pressing, pressing plants that would serve the regions around them. So recordings would be made, uh, they would be pressed, and then sent back to their respective uh, uh, country. And very soon after Gramophone slash Victor w started these expeditions, other major American and European labels likewise started expanding around the glo globe within a few years of the Victor Gramophone expansion. Okay, two more, th okay. Um, I just have some, a, a few items of material culture to show that, okay, this is a postcard dated in 1904. 
um, by, from a Bombay merchant of Western luxury items. Oh, stop that. Um, this is the name of the country, company and the state. He's in Bombay, a dealer in kinds of watches, clocks, harmoniums, phonograph, and stylo pens. I have no idea what that is. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, probably dealing mostly with expats, British colonials, and, and all that, but also the elites, the, the traditional elites of Indian society that wanted to take on aspects of Western culture to project their the dis their distance from the common person. Okay, so at least we know machines were that. That was a, a an Edison cylinder machine up there. I don't know if this uh, these pages from a uh, uh, early 1900s Indian merchants catalog are from the same merchants as put out that card, but I can. I can tell that um, whenever this was produced, this merchant was selling Edison uh, cylinder machines. This says graphophone on it, so this is a graphophone cylinder machine. This is a disc machine. I think it's a Puck is the, the, the name of it. And then some other companies, maybe Pate from, uh, Pate Brothers from uh, France uh, machine. They could all be available to you in India if if you want to do that. Okay, and I have one example of a recording of uh, a song in the Bengali language that was pressed in Calcutta. It says so right here. I don't know the exact year, but it has, I don't know if you can see, it has a trademark. Uh, the gramophone company by this time had started using the Victor trademark, the, the, the dog. The label, is uh, mostly in Hindi, uh, so I, I can't read the name of the title, but th it's sung by uh, an amateur singer, Miss Angurbala. Okay, and so uh, I'm just gonna put on a few seconds of this to show that the reason this person was recorded was not to introduce South Asian Bengali song to Americans and Europeans. It was made to be enticing for people in Bengal, the area of India, to uh, get into the record collecting and buying business, so to say. Okay, just put on a few seconds of that. Okay, I know I'm out of time. I would just say, so obviously that uh, that is meant for an Indian audience. Victor, I mean, the gramophone company alone recorded in 20 different songs in 20 different Indian dialects, hundreds of songs in each of them for sale there. So there, they were definitely focusing on planting the seed of recorded music and consuming records uh, uh, around the world at the time. I have a little selection of records that I've collected in my travels uh, from places as far flung as Ghana to um, uh, Japan, China, and all that. If you want to take a look at those, they all have Nipper the Dog on the label in some form or another, but the music comes from everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Vetter, for giving us a front row seat to the creation of the music recording industry and how it changed the way we experience music. And thank you for the terrific halftime show, too. That was great. We look forward to seeing everyone next Wednesday, March 22nd, when former chemistry professor Gene Wubbles will explore what DNA is, what it does in our cells, the process of learning how to synthesize it, and how and why it is causing a revolution in the pharmaceutical industry. 
Thank you so much for supporting the bucket courses. And I think we have, are we going to have a little more music? Yeah. Nope. Okay. Oh, darn. Thank you.